Here we go. This week on the Eldritch Lorecast. Dungeons yeah. and Dragons is not a sweet treat place. <laughs> John Merwin, how is Gary Con? I've described Gary Khan as it was very nice. What is the Shadow Dark vibe anyway? Because I hear about this game all the time. Monsters of Drakenheim is only about 12 hours from launching. I think there's I think there's a lot to talk about just in, in the artistic approach to an edition of D&D. That's a spooky pasta waiting to happen. 8 a.m. Spooky pasta. <laughs> Is that what it's called? It's that, creepy pasta. Man. I've just aged before all your eyes. Is that what the kids say? <laughs> all of that and more right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, the number one tabletop RPG and dice picnic podcast in all the realms. That's right. We are laying out the picnic mat. We've got our basket of goodies. We're sitting down. We're cracking out the dice. We're getting ready to play. We're getting out the snacks from the picnic basket. My name's Ben Byrne, by the way, if this is your first episode. I am joined, as always, by Sean Merwin, James Hake, and this week... Joined by Adam Carnavale. When you're playing role-playing games, what are the snacks at your table look like? The snacks have evolved for me over the years. I'll have some sort of soda or pop, if you will. I infinitely prefer having uh, a couple different types of chips, but there are a few people at my table who they come in and maybe you've seen this. Maybe you know someone crazy like this, but people come in and they bring cookies, sweet treats. Dungeons yeah. and Dragons is not a sweet treat place. <laughs> it is not for sweet treats. It is savory only. No, I will I, die on this hill. Then then <laughs> I will die on the hill next to you because I, I maintain the Apex board game slash tabletop game treat. And I don't know if they have these in the US. Uh, they're called Pods. Oh. And it's basically like a cup of uh, kind of like a cookie like uh, or like a crusty kind of uh, substance with like chocolate inside. And the reason is because you don't get chip dust on your fingers mm -hmm. and the chocolate doesn't melt on your fingers. So you're not getting crap all over your uh, your game components, which for me. They told me the devil would come in attempting guys. They said that. <laughs> Uh, James, hey, what about yourself? What do the snacks look like at your table? I'm fed up with people who eat pizza at D&D sessions. As good as it is, as good as it is, this is exactly the problem that you're talking about, Ben, where you get stuff all over yourself. And pizza is the worst of it all because you get all this grease all over your hands and you're expecting to touch a character sheet or worse, mm -hmm. a laptop keyboard or worse still, a tablet touch screen. Hmm. Mm, leave leave all those juicy, greasy fingerprints all over the place. I'm not here for it. Uh, Sean Merwin, what about yourself? Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying on this hill and Sean's the one who shot me. <laughs> it's a two-way Roy rumble royale on this one, I'm saying. <laughs> No, and someone else in the chat just said whiskey. That, that's good, too. My normal game is we arrive at 6.30 and we eat dinner. We are friends. So how was your week? How's the family? How, what movies did you watch? We get that all out of the way. Pizza, beer, whatever people want to bring. But then it's game time. And <laughs> I will use candy as minis. So we don't have to worry about dessert. What sort of candy? Reese's is great. Oh, uh, that's because it's circular. Need, that's a good one. Exactly. If you need uh, medium-sized people, uh, a Hershey's Kiss is good. Um, mm. If you need a large, then a, a Reese's does very well. A Reese's peanut butter cup. Uh, caramels are good for uh, for the, the five foot caramels. square. Um, yeah, so so those sorts of things. So 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 you go for the sort of darker, richer ones, right? That kind of almost feels in keeping with the savory theme, even though they mm. are sweet. Yeah, mm. and chocolate goes well with beer generally. I find. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever heard yeah, of it a, uh, I think it's technically more of a war game than it is a role-playing game, but uh, a friend of mine constantly touts the praises of Tiny Teddy's Go to War, which is basically <laughs> like a war game where your soldiers are Tiny Teddies and snakes and things, and the terrain is like gingerbread houses, I believe. I've never Tiny played Teddy's it. Tiny Teddy's like the biscuit Tiny Teddies? 
Yeah, ti- yeah. So I guess it's that Australian rolls. centric. Do you have tiny? Do you have tiny teddies we in the US? We have Teddy Grams, which are probably very similar. Mm. Okay, Teddy Grams go to war then. Um, and basically, <laughs> the idea is like every time a piece gets destroyed, then the uh, opposite side gets to eat it. Um, and so the victor is the person with the sorest belly at the end, I suppose. <laughs> Our ritual is very similar, Sean, to yours, where we kind of, you know, we have dinner beforehand. I'm a big proponent of like we'll eat pizza, we'll eat burgers or whatever, but before the game not during. And that's the same if I'm playing a board game. I like a nice break. Like, let's take a break for food rather than, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, eat pizza at the table. The one exception to that, and I've only seen this a few times, but I was impressed when I saw it, was when uh, folks cracked out the, the cheese board. The charcuterie oh, for a D and D night. I was like, "Ooh, mm. I'm in fancy town now. <laughs> Get a bit of the camembert with my dragon slaying. A bit of the brie. Have you a bit ever, of the blue cheese? Have you ever played Viticulture, the board game? No, it's a delightful, it. absolutely delightful board game. The basic objective is you're everyone has like a winery, and you're just making different types of wines over the course of some seasons or whatever. Every single time me and my friends play it, what we'll do is we'll put on, i will just be like, Google, play Italian restaurante music. And then we'll bust out some red wine, cheese and crackers while we play. And let me tell you, it rules. That's at the top of my playlist, yeah. yeah. I, I might have told this story on the Lawcast before, but we played our Wingspan and I was determined <laughs> to go for what I call the murder bird strategy, which yeah. is the birds that eat other birds. Mm. And playing the whole game, I love to put on just pleasant, dapper music that just makes you feel nice as you're watching birds. Yeah. And then every time I enact the murder bird, I would swat, swap it to Jewel of the Fates just for a few seconds <laughs> uh, to really get the the feel of the intensity of uh, a hawk diving down on, on a I experienced bird. that firsthand in a 1v1 head-to-head wingspan game with Ben while he was <laughs> Hosting me in Australia. (laughs) That was good. That was good stuff. Well, speaking of things that are happening in Australia, there is a convention coming up this weekend. I'm just quickly going to mention this because I will forget if I leave it for later. Uh, Conquest is happening in Melbourne this uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, I will be there. I actually don't know what the venue is. I better look that up. But I will be at Conquest (laughs) on the Saturday, Sunday, running Grim Hollow Games. And uh, folks there are going to get their first little sneak peek uh, at the latest update, and it is a significant update, to the Monster Hunter class, uh, which is being worked on currently by one Sean Merwin. Mm. And, uh, yeah, the games are currently full, which is awesome. I'm going to have full tables. But if you see me there, please feel free to come up, say hi. If you're going to play at one of the tables, uh, be kind. Um, uh, uh, Yeah, it'll be a good time. Uh, Come hang out at Conquest. And speaking of conventions, Sean Merwin, how was GaryCon? I've described Gary Khan as it was very nice. I had fun. For the first time in years, I signed up to run Adventures League content that I did not write. So I sat down and I didn't know. I thought, have I lost it? Have I lost the ability to take another uh, adventure and run it? And uh, it went well. My tables had quite Mm. a bit of fun as far as I could tell. And... I got to play two new games. I got to play Shadow Dark, and I got to play right. uh, uh, Bay, Brindlewood Bay. How was Shadow Dark? It was run as if it was D&D light. So it didn't, right. it didn't really embrace the Shadow Dark feel or rules. It was, it was fun. The, the, we were playing with terrain. The, the game master is uh, someone who I've played with before and he's, Great role player, lots of fun, made sure everybody had fun, but it wasn't the shadow dark that I was going for. Um, so yeah. technically, I feel like I still haven't played shadow dark because I've, <laughs> I've reviewed the game and I haven't quite gotten a game of it that embraces the rules. What is the shadow dark vibe anyway? Because I hear about this game all the time, but I kind of had it in my mind that it is sort of one of those, you know, sort of lighter, grittier D&D style things. Teos and I on Mastering Dungeons have over three or four or five or six episodes reviewed this game. He has played it. I have not. So I specifically did not play it. I only read it, didn't read about it, didn't look at interviews. Uh, with Kelsey Dion, who is the designer. And so we reviewed it to, we loved, we liked it, but we had nits to pick with it. And so I wanted to play it to actually get to this point of it's very deadly. 
It's it's harsh. It wears on you. It's you as the player have to make good choices and be very careful. And and so it embraces that OSR thing, but with with sort of new school uh, sensibilities. Mm. And mm. so and so Teos and I went back and forth about how we thought it would play. And so I wanted to actually get that experience. And myself and other people I talked to said when I played it, the game master ran it as just a late version of D&D rather than as mm. this deadly sort of thing. And mm. I, I still don't know. Uh, so mm. I'm I'm working on it. I, I want to play it with a game master who runs it as it is written to see if it does capture that that feel. It's hard at a convention, right? Because I've played Call of Cthulhu only at conventions and feel similarly that I haven't really gotten the vibe of, of Call of Cthulhu. Um, and I'm in a, uh, the opposite situation of you, Sean, this weekend at Conquest where I am for the first time running an adventure that I wrote as opposed to running like an Adventurer's League adventure that somebody else wrote which is a little a little bit nerve-wracking because I haven't had a chance to play test it, so I have no idea how it's going to run. Um, blame but Dave, it all I bl- on the author if there's a problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd be like, blame it on this guy. Um, but I believe they've put me in a place that's a little bit more isolated from what they were describing in their emails, the, the convention organizers, that's mm-hmm. a little bit more isolated on the show floor, so I might have a better chance at trying to capture that sort of grim hollow yeah. you know dark fantasy vibe but but it is really challenging to capture that on a convention when you know you a you're playing with strangers yeah. who might not all be in the mood yeah. for that you know and mm. b you've got you know seven people walking around you having different conversations and things but um you should practice like doing a session zero but as if it's a tight five you know what i mean <laughs> can you get the get the tightest little nugget of a session zero you can't just get everyone on the same page at the start that's a that's a good idea there is a lot of D news that tumbled out of gary con or around gary con uh, as well kind of little bits and pieces matt mercer and deborah ann wall consulted on the 5e dungeon masters guide the new one mm. the refresh that's coming out later this year that's it that's the news um <laughs> no there was a little bit more to it than, than that um, <laughs> the idea being i believe uh, that Matt was consulted specifically because they are, you know, they they wanted this new DMG to help DMs run the game, facilitate Fifth Edition in many different contexts, and one of those contexts being in a live play situation. And so they wanted to get Matt's experience running Critical Role for you know nigh on ten years now, um, and what lessons were learned and how what, what advice can be put in the DMG for that uh, circumstance. Which I thought was interesting that they would include, you know, the uh, for people wanting to start their own live play, whether as a hobby or, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, it's interesting that that is on their radar as something to include within the rule book itself um, or the guidebook, I suppose, itself. That's tidbit number one. Uh, tidbit. Had, that makes so a lot of sense it. to me. I mean, Matt Mercer's style of dungeon mastering is uh, certainly the most popular style. Like, I, th- I think anyone... Uh, just now joining the hobby is joining it or is aware at least of critical role and has seen Matt Mercer in, in action and kind of is trying to, or at least maybe not necessarily trying to recreate, but is certainly a lot of new people are inspired by critical role and Matt Mercer. So I think it makes Mm. a lot of sense for them to consult him specifically with regards to the dungeon masters guide that, yeah, that tracks. If, if they consulted another preeminent uh actual play podcast mm. uh gm um like i, I don't know adam carnivale from uh, dnd is for nerds they should uh, what advice would you put into a dmg <laughs> um I'd, I'd i'd have a big section that just says have fun no i i mean <laughs> obviously I'm, I'm assuming they're putting that kind of in there regardless i feel like Oh, if I had to give one piece of advice, it would be, and once again, this is something they always put in the DMG, but it's always something, I feel like it's always one paragraph tucked away, and I feel like they could devote at least an entire section of a, maybe not an entire chapter, but at least a section of a chapter to um, explaining that the dungeon master is kind of the, the arbiter of their own game, and the dungeon master is not beholden to the rules in any way. And I, I think, uh, I think a lot of newer players 
get really worried that they're not following rules. And a lot of games get stopped while people consult rules. And I think a much better system is to make it, if you're really worried about it, that's fine. Just make a note of it and come back to it later uh, mm. when the game is over. Just make a ruling in the moment and yeah, it, it'll all come out in the wash, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Tidbit news number two. two, two. Uh, they showed some new art for the D&D 2024 books, including The Wizard. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure if you're watching this on YouTube, Dante probably has artwork of The Wizard. A little sci-fi for my personal taste. It looks like something from Arcane, the TV show, which is great, but it's not what I think of when I think core D&D. But that's okay. Mm. Uh, it's personal taste only. I think it's a great piece of art. Like it looks, th- there's something very, um, with the, the art pieces that they've shown so far for The Wizard and the fighter back at PAX Unplugged last year, there's something very show-stopping, eye-catching, action pose. Yeah pieces here which i think is great for to, to kind of exemplify each of the classes but uh yeah that's just what i thought when i when i looked at it i think there's i think there's a lot to talk about just in in the artistic approach to an edition of D uh right i mean if you look between how the art for fourth edition was presented to how the art for the 2014 player's handbook was presented towards the art for how the 2024 player's handbook is being presented, right? You can see that there's kind of a lineage of, of what they want a character to be like in D and D being expressed from edition to edition, right? Sure. Uh, where fifth edition has kind of this idea that it's returning to form in a way. So adventures are typically fairly, fairly scrappy, especially in the player's handbook. Uh, and as fifth edition has gone on, we've kind of gone in that more fourth edition comic booky Netflix's arcane style direction. I think for, for every, for every class in general, we want those characters to be big and splashy and colorful and have a very sort of, uh, heightened, exaggerated bent to them rather than being more first edition style, you know, dirt farmers turned adventurers sort of guys. Well, I think the, and it's cool to see, you know, hopefully that this new, uh, new version, this new edition, this new 0.5 edition, you know, whatever we end up calling this thing has a unique art style of its own separate from the 2014 fifth edition. But when you compare it to fourth and third in particular, I think the thing that the, the word I was looking for before was that there's, it's very grand, but it's also very clean. By comparison, there was something mm. really grungy about third and fourth edition art that I've seen in particular. I think I notice it in cobbles and in goblins. I think you can really track the changing art style. I feel like it's you see it the most there. Sure, uh, if you yeah, compare yeah. 3.5 to fourth ed to to earlier than 3.5 as well, uh, cobbles and goblins are like the archetypical design uh, design decisions in in the various art styles, I think. US and Canada game retailers, brick and mortars, will be allowed to sell the upcoming D&D game books two weeks earlier than release date. So this includes mm. uh, Vecna, Eve of Ruin, which will uh, you can get from May 7th in a game store in US and Canada, uh, The Endless Staircase, or Adventures from the Endless Staircase, Journeys to Quests. the Endless Staircase. Quests, Quests. from the Endless Staircase. Mm. Something's happening. There's a staircase and something's happening on it. On July 9th, if you want to go into a local retailer in US and Canada. Uh, Player's Handbook, September 3rd, DMG, October 9th, and Monster Manual next year, Feb 4th. Um, uh, It's a cool move. Uh, Worth noting, you can't order it at your local retailer for delivery. You have to go in and get it, uh, is what they're kind of specifically, which is maybe a, a, a tactic to stop people using Amazon. Uh, as a right. way to to sell it early, it's it's funny. Wizards has this relationship with game stores, and at some points, they, they're acting as if game stores are the greatest thing to bring players into the game and spread the community. And so they support them in that way by giving free products or having game days or having these supports like D and D encounters at in the fourth edition days, where it was like a magic night. Only it was a D and D night. Every Wednesday, you'd go in and you'd play, and then they would sort of lose track of that, or someone would come into power at Wizards and say, "Why are we supporting game stores? They should be supporting us." Let's forget that, and then they will go away and and stop doing things to support game stores, and then the pendulum will swing back to here. Let's give this, and 
I think the pendulum is now swinging back in the direction of supporting game stores as well as they can with the economic and uh, business hurdles that are in, in the way from doing that. It does seem like it comes in fits and starts, huh? Yeah, there were, there were uh, collector's editions, I think, of, I want to say, Spelljammer that were like retail only for a little while. Oh, all of those special editions are retail only. All the alt covers are. All the alt covers, yeah. I don't think this is unique to Wizards of the Coast. I think a lot of companies do this, but I, f- I feel like I see Wizards of the Coast and a bunch of other companies do this very, like this cyclical thing where someone comes in, makes a mistake, they f- or not necessarily makes a mistake, but they make a design decision that doesn't really gel very well and they've made a mistake. And so they have to go back, remedy the mistake. And then the people who learned that mistake come and go new people step in make the same mistake and then have to learn the same lesson over and over and over again and i feel like wizards of the coast are maybe now re- remembering that yeah I, th- I think game stores are absolutely the place where this this um this grows it's amazing that game stores as an entire institution are just dead following lockdowns you know what i mean mm-hmm. following the disruption that covid did to supply lines and people's you know patterns of behavior it's unbelievable that game stores mm-hmm. survived i mean not all game stores survived that's for sure but yeah. the, yeah, the, the, the fact was, that we have enough that it's still influencing what wizards does on a like a product strategy level that is like strangely heartwarming to me yeah i agree yeah. We, we it feels like we've bounced back here in mm-hmm. melbourne where it was kind of game store armageddon for mm-hmm. kind of 2021 in particular a lot of the the local ones closed but we, we actually got one opening this week uh, near us, nice. which is exciting. So, nice. not that we'll get the books uh, early. Australians are probably going to have to wait a month now <laughs> before <laughs> those books arrive. But, like, whatever, you know, that's not but a complaint. One, of the, um, one of the hard things about game stores is it's impossible to get metrics, right? You can count how many sales sure. you have on this site or that site, but you don't know how many people came in and played in your game day or those sorts of things. So it instantly becomes something that the more analytical marketing sales people shy away from because they can't put their finger exactly on numbers or the Mm. zeitgeist of what's happening at these stores. Speaking of things that you'll be able to buy from a store, but not two weeks early because it's not included in that two week early thing. Uh, is the making of the original D&D 1970 to 1977, uh, the history book that they're doing as a celebration of the 50th anniversary. You can see what's in it, kind of. You can't read it, but you can see the sections that are in it in the table of contents that's been published. It seems pretty in-depth. It's like a 500-page book, 500, 570 pages, something like that. What are the, what are the major headings? Great question. <laughs> Apparently, there's going to be a lot of, you know, never-before-seen notes and letters and things passed between people. The section I'm most interested to read, and it seems like it's a pretty beefy section, I kind of the leading up to to what became Dungeons and Dragons, the, the forefathers of D&D kind of experimenting with Chainmail and their other games mm. and the influences that they had and how they settled finally uh, on Dungeons and Dragons as the game that, that took the world by storm. There are a lot of histories of the creation of D&D that have been made. And they've been made by people with a, a variety of different viewpoints and biases. Uh, the one I go to always is Shannon Applecline's Designers and Dragons, uh, which just strikes me as an incredibly... Uh, Applecline in general is a very in-depth researcher. Mm. Uh, but I'm very curious about this one because the last book of this type that Wizards made in collaboration was Art and Arcana, sort of a history of D&D through its artwork. But it, it, the slickness of its production and the sort of like longingness that it gazes at D&D with, it can kind of betrays it as a, as a thing that's financed by the people who publish the game, right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's, I think it's great to have these kind of like glowing pay-ins to, to D&D because I yeah. think D&D is worthy of that. As, as long as you, you, know, you, you understand the perspective that uh you know the author and the powers that we have in creating this thing um but that's why i'm so interested in the uh in the new the new artifacts that are coming out of it right the new you know actual Mm. letters the scans the things because that's i mean that's primary source right there you can draw whatever opinions you want 
from seeing it way back in the very beginning. I understand that, is it John Peterson started the book? And then at some point, I think Jason Tondro, who is a game designer at Wizards, came over from Paizo, started to also work on it. And he, uh, Jason, is an academic, right? He comes from the academic world. I see that being a history of the game, understanding that Wizards is putting this history out. But I'm almost okay with that because I want the history. I want those. I want to be a historical, historically accurate document. Show me the yeah. letters between Gygax and Arnis and show me the contracts mm. and, and this and that. I get enough gossip in 2024. <laughs> I don't need any more gossip from 1970s. <laughs> uh, I, I want the history and what can I learn as a player, as a DM, as a game designer from these lessons? Not, ooh, they didn't like each other. Ooh, look what. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, just a quick shout out. Uh, a lot of this information that I'm drawing on, some extra screenshots that I saw of uh, artwork of, of a beholder kind of behind a party lurking in the shadows uh, was shared on Twitter by a Christian Hoffer. Um, if you go to, Christian's got an article, I'm just going to quickly post it in the chat right now. Um, uh, it, there's a, it's an in-depth discussion with Chris Perkins and Justice Arman um, from the design team, kind of looking back on the last kind of 12 to 18 months of D&D, but also what they're trying to achieve with these new adventures coming out, Infinite Staircase being one of them, uh, and Eve of uh, Ruin, Vecna, Eve of Ruin being the other one, uh, trying to pay homage uh, to the last uh, couple of years of D&D. It's a, it's a too in-depth article for me to be able to summarize here. Mm. Um, but something that did come out, leaked by Roll20 apparently, uh, of all places, <laughs> was the adventures from quests from the Infinite Staircase as an anthology Um being a bunch of old adventures that they are shining up into the given the 5e polish like um tales from the yawning portal was uh, back yeah. in the day uh, i enjoyed that book i used an adventure from that um, i love that book as well i think ghosts of salt marsh is better as far as anthologies go <laughs> well, <laughs> tales from the yawning portal has my favorite ever dungeon in it so i have to make it my favorite Ooh, which book. one it's uh, sunless citadel i absolutely adore that adventure Mm-hmm. I started my most recent yeah. campaign with a riff on Sunless Citadel. Oh yeah, it's good. It oh, yeah. works. It's, it's good stuff. Great. <laughs> uh, it's it's it. a little long for me. I I okay. it, it's definitely a dungeon crawl. Anyway, we're off topic. Let's talk about this <laughs> Lost Caverns of Sochian or something. Well, they are. They are. <laughs> yeah, these are dungeon crawl adventures, right? Especially because they're uh, the you know. And correct me if you think I'm wrong on this. Uh, uh, from a different era, a different culture within role playing games, where today. Playing D anD D is much more about like what are the characters thinking and where are the characters going and what 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 are, what are their relationships and w- what what NPC do they have strong relationships to that's going to drive their character forward and their character development mm. as opposed to like throwing the party down the bottom of a seventy room dungeon and being like all right let's discover what, you, what what's in each room um, mm. the 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 player characters have become the primary characters, not the dungeon itself, um, mm. as a as a proclamation, as a hypothesis rather than a definitive statement. But anyway, yeah. mm. I am now yeah. digressing. Interesting, though, because Beyond the Crystal Cave, when it came out, was known for its not being like any of the other adventures because it relies mm. heavily on role playing and on problem okay. solving without violence. Uh, Pharaoh was one of my favorite adventures from back in the day. I was hoping that they would take Pharaoh like they took uh, Tomb of Annihilation they, they right. take, uh, mm. and expand it because there are actually three adventures in a series called Desert of Desolation. And you could have expanded that into a larger 250 page adventure. I was hoping it would happen, but it didn't. But I'm happy no to see it Those are Tracy Hickman adventures of Ravenloft <laughs> and Dragonlance fame. He knew what he yeah. was doing. He knew what he was he doing. Did. You did. Uh, alongside Beyond the Crystal Cave uh, and Pharaoh is coming uh, the Lost Caverns of Soj Kant, which I only know how to pronounce because of Pax Unplugged. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, the Lost City, When a Star Falls, and this one I recognize, the, the infamous expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which oh. uh, has a fun twist in it, um, oh. which is pretty infamous. But I, I'm not going to give away the twist of this one. If you don't know it and you want to play this adventure and your players don't know it, 
give it a go and let us know how you went. But uh, there is a fun twist in here that has become very famous, I feel, uh, in D&D mythology, canon, yeah. history. And then, of course, late last week, the news coming through that Tome of Beasts from Kobold Press has arrived on D&D Beyond on list of things that was not on my bingo card. This Tome of Beasts is one of the best monster manuals for 5th edition. I, I love that book. I've loved it for years. I've used it for years. The, the bigger shock. Right, that you're talking about here, Ben, is that uh, that it's on D&D Beyond because they're making tales of the Valiant. You know, all, all power to them. Kobold made such strong statements and took such a strong stance at the start of last year. They called their new role-playing game initially Black Flag in rebellion uh, against, uh, you know, Wizards of the Coast decision-making at the time last mm. year. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's great to see, though, uh, you know, that... that uh, uh, people will have fans of Tome of Beasts and fans of D&D Beyond will have access to that book because it's, you know, James, you and I discussed this off air. It's one of those books that um, I used and loved. It almost became my monster manual, like my default monster manual for about a year there. And then as I've started using D&D Beyond more and more and more, it started to fall off my rotation because... I wasn't searching for monsters in it. If I knew of a monster that I wanted to pull from there, I could go to that book and, and pull it. But I wasn't searching that book anymore because I was using the D&D Beyond search function. Mm-hmm. Um, whether as with that in there now, you know, I'm going to have the, the, the crystal dragon and the, the, no, what is it? It's a void dragon, like a star dragon and the, the, void the molten dragon, dragon yeah. and all yeah. those things. The, the wind <laughs> dragon I've used to James great effect. <laughs> <laughs> He's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I've used that boy dragon before. I I love that guy. I'm so happy for you. You had such a genuine look of joy on your face. That was beautiful. <laughs> I I will I do like the void dragon. I've never used it, but I've used the wind dragon, and I will I will say that the wind dragon is best dragon. Uh, very unpredictable. Very um spirited away that dragon feels in its rule set. If they don't have a search function tab for <laughs> Lady in Water, uh, then they're missing out because Tome of Beasts has at least four ladies in water. I think one of them's maybe not in water, but she's still doing the whole like seductress thing. In um, water, comma, lady. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They need that uh, because there's the Rizalka, the Drowned Maiden, the Abominable Beauty, I don't think is in water, the Lorelei. There's the four off the top of my head. There might even be a fifth one in there, but uh, yeah, too many ladies in water. Um, <laughs> or not enough. I don't know. Maybe you you decide. We could get more. Uh, we we can more. find more room. I absolutely guarantee it. Uh, Quick, speaking- talk to Monty and Kelly. I'll bet they can put yeah. some wet ladies in there, but. <laughs> Monsters of Drakenheim is only about 12 hours from launching on Kickstarter. Um, uh, so uh, you can check out last week's episode of the Lawcast uh, to get all the goss on that. Um, uh, it's a new book, 150 plus new monsters, but it's not just monsters. Uh, of course, there's law for those monsters in there, but there's also a uh, harvest and crafting system. Uh, there's layers for the monsters, so it's trying to give you kind of the whole encounter, not just uh, kind of like a, a stat block to use. Mm. Uh, a new deadly conditions uh, system, which I, I suspect as a fan of, of Legends of Zelda, James, you because you were on last week when, when Monty and Kelly were talking mm-hmm. about that, um, and the idea of the deadly conditions being like, what if uh, you, you get put on fire? Or what if you put a monster on fire? What if you get frozen? You know, uh, mm. interesting conditions like that that make encounters feel more challenging. Mm-hmm. I got to play test some of that up in their studio. It was very, very fun. Martin, our layout person, came over from England. And Joe Rosso and I came up from our various locations and talked, uh, sat down and had a nice game with uh, with the dudes. It was lots of fun conditions uh they added a bit of difference to a game let's put it that way what was the monster or monsters i i'm not gonna say okay. not, and, I do, <laughs> I, and i do remember and i do uh, remember enigmatic but, yeah i i'm going to wait and i'm going to let uh let the book speak for itself there was some regeneration happening i'll i'll just leave it at that okay Mm. Love some good regener. Ah, oh, if you want your players to hate you quickly, describe how a monster is regenerating its wounds. Uh, <laughs> I, that's hate you more. Um, 
<laughs> but some of the art coming out of there is also amazing. Again, I talked about it a little bit last week, but I love the, um, uh, they talked about the the uh, alchemists, the apothecaries. That's the class that came out in Sebastian Crowe's Guide to Drakenheim. Now they've got apothecary uh, enemy stat blocks for folks that pushed the science a little too far. Um, and there's just sick art of, I'm going to slightly give this away. There's a really cool one of a dude who, I think he's got syringes for arms but the the like supply tubes that are feeding the syringes is like built into his Question. face. Syringes yes. for fingers or syringes for arms? <laughs> no, syringes. <laughs> because that's different. <laughs> syringes for arms. My Edward Scissorhands too. <laughs> Edward syringe that's- arms. That is something different. I'll grant yeah. you that. Yeah, no, you gotta, you gotta see the syringe arm man. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a spooky pasta waiting to happen. Um, uh, <laughs> so monsters <laughs> launches eight a.m. Spooky pasta. <laughs> is that what it's called? Did I get that right? It's <laughs> creepy pasta, man. <laughs> spooky pasta is so good, though. I've just aged oh, man. before. I've just aged before all your eyes. Is that what the kids say? <laughs> <laughs> Some sort of spooky pasta. Even I know what it was talking about, Ben. That's how bad you are. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Great. I'm glad. No, uh, I'm not. Uh, I haven't just turned fifty in front of you all of you. Um, me. You are a never-ending <laughs> source of entertainment. You delight uh, me. <laughs> Kickstarter launches eight a.m. Go check it out uh, on the twenty-sixth of March, Eastern Daylight Time, and go listen to the cinematic as well. Sorry, go listen to Dante. Cut the cinematic in here. <laughs> The development of the D&D Lego set, which originated with Lego Ideas competition back in 2022, I'm pretty sure. Uh, that set uh, by Lucas Bolt, a.k.a. Bolt Builds, uh, was unveiled as the winner back at that time. And now uh, Lego have officially unveiled the final... Dante can put an image of it on the screen. This is the very definition of totalitarianism. It looks cool. Has anybody else had a chance to look at it? I really like it. I really like that the um that the inn is a mimic and they don't shove it in your face. There's a you can see that uh there's that sort of purpling purple tile on the top of the uh, uh on the roof and yeah, that right. matches with the uh what's it called the sort of pre-order bonus of a mimic treasure chest if you get if you oh. like buy it buy it online or something like that so yeah i think it's very cute is there a better crossover audience than D and legos especially people who will sit down for five hours and work on one thing <laughs> With a book in front of them. <laughs> well, Ben will tell you the very first thing I did when I showed up in Ghostfire's offices in Australia was bring a Lego set with me. I brought a like medieval tavern Lego set with me for nice. people to just like work on at lunch breaks. I love that thing uh, yeah. because it got me through a particularly stressful period of just like so much work to do. Let me zone out and build uh, this Lego building uh, while just so I can I'm not focusing on work for you know 20 minutes. Lego set includes. Includes, uh, as James said, the tavern, which I didn't pick, was a mimic. The dragon looks really sick. Uh, there's other D&D monsters included. From what I could see, look like an owlbear, a beholder, a displacer beast. There's skeletons. There's a gelatinous cube. Lego works great for minis, D&D minis, in my opinion, because you can do, with the blocks, you can make so many different you know, locations and stuff like that. Mm. And it'll be nice to have, because anytime I've done it previously, I've had to represent every single enemy has also been had to be represented by one of those little yellow pieces or whatever they're all just looking the same so it'll be nice to have some monster monsters not only that but and i genuinely think this is the coolest bit of this whole thing the lego set will include a fifth edition adventure that you can play using the Mm. lego set uh i believe this is going to be a free download for anybody who buys the the set and it will at some point be available on D&D Beyond as well. I, I think that's the coolest thing is buying the Lego set, putting it together, and then playing the adventure. Because y- that's my one uh, gripe with Lego as an adult 
is that you kind of, once you put it together, there's not much more to do with it. Uh, but the idea of running a D&D adventure using it uh, sounds like a great time. Some of my dearest childhood memories are of building Bionicle in particular and yeah. playing with them as action figures afterwards, mm. right? Because every, mm. every monthly issue of the Lego magazine would come with a comic book that, you know, uh, upon reread as an adult were very obviously ads, but, you know, they came with a comic book that had w- really some semblance of a storyline and character for those guys uh, and like stakes and drama. And I wanted like reading those comics made me want to play, play with those figures and tell stories like that and customize them and make them my own. And so if that's what, what D&D Legos can do for people, I'm all for it. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, thinking back now, my earliest introduction to wargaming was creating like armies with Legos and then just improvising some rules about like, well, this guy's really strong, so he kills this one, but then this one hits him, you know, back and forth. The least cool part of that announcement is that the Lego set's going to cost 360 USD. I want Lego. I want to have some Lego, especially after our Lego blacksmith up there. I'd love to have like the the Lord of the Rings um, Rivendell set looks super sick. But at 360 USD, which is probably something easily like 700 AUD, if not maybe 600 AUD. That's a pretty penny. Those pennies are very pretty. Spicy meatball. Very, very spicy. Um, I've seen that Rivendell set in person and it's incredible it's yeah. maybe the most beautiful lego set i've ever seen <laughs> you look like you're about to cry just. I, I i want it in my house so badly <laughs> yes yeah well i'm lucky we might end up getting one of the D uh, D ones for the office uh, uh orders go live if you're a lego insider member um april 1st you get uh to order it a little bit earlier but for everybody else it's april 4th also D are licensing out to converse dem shoes what got them dragons on them is the news from Converse. That Was that actually the headline? Yeah. <laughs> this is my headline. Oh, okay. I saw them. They, they had them at, uh, at GaryCon in a display case, and they are oh, pretty, yeah. they're pretty fancy. Yeah, if you like Converse and you like D&D, you could do much worse than getting yourself a pair of these kicks. I'll tell you that. They are. I, so, I Sean, will you, be, will you be replacing all of the shoes you own with D&D Converse? All two of them, yes. There we go. <laughs> I'm the same. Mm-hmm. I have two pairs of shoes and they're Another on rotation. Another satisfied customer. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, they've also got a T-shirt. If you want a Converse logo inside a gelatinous cube, my God, have I got something for you. Um, or the very loud, very mildly punk trucker cap with a glib joke about smiling DMs being a bad thing um, because... It, they're vicious. I was going to say, generally, I don't wear things that advertise games, but uh, you know, sometimes <laughs> you sometimes you can make an exception. A bit of news coming out from GDC, where Larian Studios CEO Sven Venk, Hi, my name is Sven Venke. said that uh, Larian will not produce DLC for Baldur's Gate Three, nor will they be creating a Baldur's Gate Four. A dagger. A dagger through my heart. That's what this is. No, no, we're talking about Baldur's Gate, not Daggerheart. You're right. A longsword through my heart is what there this is. Go. I I already knew because Larian don't do, for their previous titles, they've not been huge on DLC. So I knew mm. there was always going to be a high chance that they weren't going to do any DLC for BG3. But then I there was an announcement from uh, Sven, is it the CEO of Larian? Yeah, Sven Winker. He was like, oh, you know, maybe we'll do some DLC for Baldur's Gate 3. And I foolishly got my hopes up. Not not so foolishly. Apparently they started working on it. Like they they were... Do we know like the basic outline? Because I feel like hell was a really unexplored location. No, he never said what, what the actual outline for it was. I, I do want to clear something up about this. Um... Uh, particular piece of news because there has been some uh, apocryphal reporting around it uh, from journalistic websites um, who have been, uh, you know, perhaps inferring a little more than they should. The the kind of uh, discourse around this, if you will, is that Larian chose not to, you know, march to the beat of Wizards of the Coast's drum or Hasbro's drum because Hasbro's trying to uh, restructure itself as a publisher of video games, at least in some capacity. Sven has since come out and said, "Has uh, Wizards of the Coast when, had nothing to do with their decision not to do Baldur's Gate 4. This was not a, a bad blood situation between them. 
Uh, so if you're hearing that being the case, that is just absolutely not the case. And anybody who told you that it is, is inferring information uh, rather than actually quoting from Sven. The reason they've chosen not to do it is just because they're creatively kind of burned out on uh, on Baldur's Gate. Um, and like you said, Adam, they, they want to do something different, do something new. Sven talked about how, you know, they had all these ideas for a combat system, possibly building off what's in Baldur's Gate, but they were constrained because the D&D IP requires them to to simulate 5th edition combat, you know, at least in some capacity. And, and so they want to try new things that doesn't constrain them them, uh, creatively within the license of uh, 5th edition d and uh, The other conjecture I saw was that folks were saying Larian don't want to have to pay Wizards of the Coast the licensing fees for their next game. I think that's pure conjecture as well. Larian probably, I was going to look this up, I never got around to it, but I would I would uh, assert, although there's been a lot of assertions around this, uh, that Larian probably made more money on Baldur's Gate 3 than they did on any of the D- Divinity games, uh, even after having paid the licensing fees. Um, so I can't imagine that would necessarily be the case because I think the smart money is to make a Baldur's Gate 4, but, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Go, go read. There's articles on IGN. I think are probably the best ones that just kind of draw on his quotes without making assertions around or drawing false conclusions, uh, around what, who he's talking about and what he said. Or making quotes out of context. When the layoffs at Wizards of the Coast happened at the end of last year, one of the things, one of the bits of commentary about it was from Swan Atlarian, who basically said, you know, my heart goes out to you guys. Basically, all of the people who we worked directly with the Wizards have, have been fired. You can imagine that he doesn't want to work with wizards after that sort of situation. But that's all it is, right? It's imagining. Because at the end of the day, Larian is a company that is owned by its designers. And that means that he's drawn between two goals primarily. One, owning the company, right? Making good business decisions. And two, being a good game designer. And if he's got stuff that he wants to game design that the D&D system won't allow him to, and it does sound like he has like the first draft, of the new game script kind of like in some form already. You made a tweet about that some months ago as well. Mm. Uh, then, then the only answer available to them is move forward, right? Uh, between those two tensions. Uh, he did have a quote uh, that was apparently from GDC this year uh, about, you know, being disgusted with publishers who lay off staff, who then discover they don't have any uh, any developers anymore, and then they have to rehire developers, and there's institutional knowledge churn at game developers. Um, and somebody tried to tie that quote to being about Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast. You know, the sentiment is shared, but I don't, I, I think it's, I think it's a strong uh, inference to assume that he's talking about Hasbro when really the comments m- much closer match with the layoffs that have happened in the game industry uh, over the last 18 months, you know. And every time I see people talking about layoffs, there's been, un- and it's incredibly unfortunate, there's been layoffs uh, across all sorts of industries uh, uh, currently. You know, the health industry apparently is having massive layoffs in the US. Um, people like, and I am people, people like drama. I and people love drama. <laughs> Mm. And they'll try mm. to find it wherever they can, I think. There is a high likelihood that I make the thumbnail for this episode, Sven with tears on his face and a big cross through Wizards of the Coast. And if you clicked on this video because of that thumbnail, you fell for it. You <laughs> fell for it and you're part of the problem. <laughs> but also, I am you, so don't, <laughs> don't feel too bad. Understand <laughs> that I, we share something and you should click on the next one of these videos you see in case I'm here and you can sympathize with me. Yeah, absolutely. Like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> and share, share and share. Definitely share. Get more people hitting that, uh, that, that uh, clickbait. On a, on a very sad note to round out the news this week, uh, James M. Ward passed away last week. Uh, James Ward, a uh, kind of luminary within the tabletop RPG industry, very uh, influential uh, on Dungeons & Dragons as a game, uh, but also the, the tabletop RPG industry as a whole, worked at uh, TSR for 20 years, uh, wrote uh, the Metamorphosis Alpha game, which I believe, uh, according to one article at least, was the first kind of big sci-fi uh, role-playing game uh, out there. Uh, and it was also kind of influential on D&D in terms of introducing gods and deities into the game, uh, uh, played at Gary Gygax's table um, when D&D was being developed. 
uh, and authored for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Deities and Demigods, uh, which was a supplement that brought them much more into the foreground. I think uh, Deities and Demigods might be the only extra supplemental book that I have, for any edition of D&D, that I have just read from cover to cover. I thought it was really, I really liked it. I thought it was very interesting and had a lot of great insight into how gods work in a Dungeons and Dragons or high fantasy setting. That was my favorite book of AD&D. It added so much knowledge to the game, but so much um, creativity as well. My freshman year of college, I had to take a course, uh, Greek and Roman mythology. And I probably could have passed that class with just the Deities and Demigods book. Uh, I had so much going in. And if you were uh, a player back then and you remember the spells that were Dramage, Dramage is this and drama just that Dramage is jim ward spelled backwards and that was uh mm. jim ward's character and yeah so he uh he added a great deal to this game that we are playing right now all right we have a little bit of uh time left here because we got through the news faster than i expected to sorry i probably shouldn't have blown through the um the whole uh, uh converse thing no um, you were fine to do that <laughs> <laughs> That is the opposite expression of the one you had earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Adam, uh, if folks want to find you, I'm just going to give you a few minutes here to vamp. Uh, if folks want to find you, if they want to find D&D is for nerds, uh, where can they go? Uh, don't worry, I'll find them. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can be found, uh, you can find me at Retro Archetype on any social media. Uh, or if you're looking for the podcast itself, you can search d and is for Nerds or just go to Sans Pants Radio, Sans is in without, pantsradio.com and, uh, or just plug us into any podcasting app. I have recently, my um, one of my coworkers was like, Adam, every single time you're talking about the podcast, you talk about the website, you talk about your ad handle, and you forget <laughs> to mention, just search it in the podcasting app. Whatever podcasting app you use, search for D&D is for nerds and you'll find us there. You could, you could search it in this one right now. Yeah, whatever one um, you're using. How was, uh, and it might not uh, be online yet because I know you record a little bit in advance, but how was recording with Broden Kelly from uh, Auntie Donna? <laughs> <laughs> I he is an incredibly funny man and um he uh, really commands a room which sure. was a delight to watch and every now and then I remembered that I was the dungeon master. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> um it was very funny as well cuz before we any guested show that we or any show with a guest, I should say, guested show doesn't make sense. Any show with a guest that we do, I always check just before with the guest. I'm like, hey, just really quickly, how familiar are you with Dungeons and Dragons? It's okay if not at all. Uh, just so I know like how technical basically I can be with you. And Broden was like, Yeah, I've played DD a ton. And what I didn't realize is what he meant by that is he has done comedy bits while people play D and D around him, basically. So he, uh, uh, it didn't really come up much to be honest, because once again, he dominated that space. It was very yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah. For, for folks that don't know, Auntie Donna are an Australian, uh, comedy troupe who are interesting to recommend only because they're an acquired taste, perhaps. Um, that is a good way of describing it. Yeah, or, it's an acquired taste, but once you have it, you can't. It's, it's, it's stuck in you. So are you saying an acquired taste to your international audience? Like, are they kind of Aussie humor or even among Aussie comedians, are they a bit avant-garde? Look, <laughs> if you like... If you if you like uh, if the idea of a uh, a woman smoking the world's longest cigarette is a little bit amusing to you, this might be very funny to you as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, their 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 humor it can be a little crass, a little gross out, but that's not where they're they're centered. I'm getting too academic about this now. I'm getting academic about Auntie Donna, um, but that's not where they're they're centered. They're 
they're they're not afraid to um I don't know they're so hard to describe which I I'll think go is, watch them. is I'll, part I'll, of their like, success if if they're undescribable I'll go watch them <laughs> it's it's kind of like they do you know the Family Guy joke where Peter falls off a bike and he does the like leg thing mm-hmm. you know for like and the joke is that he's just doing it for so long mm. they've got bits that are kind of like that but mm. that doesn't describe them fully because the way the dice it's, I'm the dice master. So, have you seen Back to the Future? Oh, Who's wow. the dice master, me or you? You are. No, you are. We are paper boys. The feather and the sword come into play in round four. There is no winner because it's about teamwork where all of us work together to eventually beat the winner who determines who the losers are. So it's work as a team? No, because out of the f- top four players, right? It's better There's three with, of us. Yeah, it's better with eight people. I would um, recommend they have a, they had a Netflix uh, show that came out recently, Auntie Donna's Big Old House of Fun, I think it's called. Yeah. And I think it's because uh, it was paid, bought and paid for by Netflix. So I assume it's available anywhere in the world that Netflix is. Uh, just because it's a really polished version of their comedy, I would recommend watching that as a gateway to get into them. Right, right. right as opposed right. to their YouTube channel. That's probably smart. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, and they've also been doing D&D live plays more recently, um, which has been fun. Um, but don't go watch that. Go watch D&D is for nerds. Uh, <laughs> oh, go yeah, listen to yeah, D&D yeah, is for nerds. Right. You can do either. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, cool. All right. Well, that, that probably, we, we've probably got 50 minutes of podcast here. At least, <laughs> and that's, what we, that's what we aim for. <laughs> oh, um, God. Uh, if you, uh, we didn't get around to any emails this week, but uh, if you want to email, you can send them through to podcast at ghostfiregaming.com. Uh, you can uh, like this, uh, give us the stars, whatever your podcast app craves, we crave it too, um, because it helps us get out to more listeners. Uh, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. You can find us on Twitch, or actually, this is important bit. You can find us on Twitch at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on a Monday, uh, 4 p.m. <coughs> Pacific Standard Time on a Monday, and starting next week, we will be 9 a.m. Australian Eastern Time because we are turning off the sun after 6 o'clock. Uh, Daylight Savings is coming to an end, so we will be at 9 a.m. <laughs> um, you will get Dale and I bright and early, bleary-eyed. It, it'll be good. I'll it's crazy I'm never guesting it. on this again. Yeah. <laughs> 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 at least not until Daylight Savings starts. <laughs> Uh, I've been Ben Byrne here with Sean Merwin, James Haig, Adam Carnavale, and we will catch you all again next week for another episode of the Eldritch Lawcast. Because then you wouldn't be hearing this voice if it was. A Can I show. stop smiling? Are we yeah, we probably, <laughs> probably had the fire go <laughs> across the, the screen. Um, so, yeah, we're probably off. Um, thanks, Demac IRL. Um, yes, we are very professional. <laughs>